and losing that, and, and also the image that I have in the industry, you know, and, I, and open myself to the unknown and deeply listening was uh, very important in the process. Welcome to The Ownership Game with Gary Montalbo. What would it take to get into the driver's seat of your life and leave your mark? The Ownership Game starts now. What would you do if overnight you lost it all? That's the question Luis Gabriel Segura, my guest today, had to grapple with. Gabriel has an extensive 30-year career in the world of finance. After successfully launching his own lending company and building status, success, and wealth, Gabriel lost it all after he became the victim of financial fraud. At the same time, his daughter began struggling severely with her mental health, and his wife Giselle had been diagnosed with cancer. You may recognize Giselle's story from our April 30th episode. In the blink of an eye, Gabriel's life had been turned upside down, and he was forced into a deep grieving process where he had to rediscover himself and his purpose. Through a lot of reflection, deep spiritual work, and a great deal of courage, Gabriel began the process of reinventing himself and building a new life. I'm so honored to have him share his story with us today. So Gabriel, I wanted to start our conversation at the beginning, I guess. I, I, I want to hear a little bit about how you grew up and you're from Colombia, no? Yes. Okay. So tell me, tell me about what was it like for you growing up in Colombia? It was beautiful. <laughs> I, I grew up in, a, in an environment where I had a lot of friends, Gary, I, in, in my neighborhood where 20, 30 kids playing all together. Uh, the TV at that time was only two channels, so it was quite boring, the TV, and no no, no internet devices. So I pl- I, my, my life in, as a child was a lot of outdoors. It was beautiful. <laughs> two channels. <laughs> yes. Yes, no distractions. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole, whole other lifetime ago. And, and what, big family? I have two sisters. I think, yes, my, my family, beautiful family, very blessed, um, the relationship with my parents. Probably I will do a highlight of my father, that my father, he died like uh, 16 years ago, but he, the, 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 the more important legacy that he gave me was my ability to question, one, and second, that he was very humble, quite uncommon for, mm. for men at that time, very humble man, and and I appreciate that so much. He had been helping me so much in my life. My mom, he was an architect. My mom is still alive, and she's an artist. Also, she she gave me wings. She allowed me to fly. She was not a controlling person. So, and the of course the influence of of, the, of my friends. I'm being blessed with um, a lot of friends. And he's been keeping those friendships, some of those friendships up to today. So very blessed. Amazing. So how did you end up, because you went into, so your first, your first school, bachelor's was in industrial engineering, if I remember correctly. Is that kind of following your father's footsteps in no. some way? Because there's a relationship there, no? No, no, no. I, no? I, am, I got my bachelor's in Colombia in industrial engineer. And I, at the time, was between being an architect or being in finance or business, uh-huh. business. And I chose the last one, especially because architect at that time, at least in Colombia, was not such a good, it was hard economically, beautiful and art. Mm-hmm. But so I chose to be more a business and that is what I have done. Yeah. Yeah, so you went on to create your, tell me about your business, because you created a business in financial consulting, and you've been doing this for 30 years now. I I started my career in consulting in one of the, the big five. Uh, I hate it. 
I hate it. It was super controlling. That that kind of environment where the company thinks that the employees, the soul of the employees belong to them, let's put it that way. And I didn't mm-hmm. like it. I moved very quickly to finance. I started working in banking. Then I was I got the opportunity from a bank that gave me an opportunity to bring to the United States and they they, they got my they pay my or did my citizenship process for me. Very blessed. And then that was until year probably two thousand. In year two thousand that bank got into a bankruptcy situation in Colombia. Even though our bank mm-hmm. here in the United States was okay, we have to close. I mean, the, the bank was eventually sold. But uh, for me, I got into a nice opportunity to and to create a company. It's a financial entity, a lend, lending private company. The technical word is factoring, factoraje in Espanol, factoring, which is that we finance companies, we lend to companies. So since year 2002, pro, 2001, I started doing that. And in 2003, <clears throat> I resigned from that company. That was one of the uh, many steps into the abyss, ab- abyss uh, the, to the hole, into the, not, into the un- unknown. Abyss. In abyss, sorry, yeah. abyss. And, and no, stepping no, into the unknown, that was probably my, 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 my second time. And I, and I resigned. I remember I called my wife one day, say, I'm miserable here. And she said, come, come home. We have two kids. <laughs> so I, I, I swallow what I had in, in savings in the 401k and I went home uh-huh. and I started structuring my, a dream was creating my own financial entity. And I started in 20, 2004, 2004. And I kept that company until year 2022. I, I was able to s- sold that company. Uh, it was it was not voluntary. Let's put it away. <laughs> oh, it was voluntary, but I went into a big fraud, very big fraud, and and I lost it. I lost the company. I was I had yeah. I own a lot of money to investors, and I in order to rescue investors, I chose to sell the company lost all the money that I built in 20 in, in 19 years and uh, yeah th- that was a little bit of that and then after that it was a process of big uh, grieving it was hard very hard because yeah. it, was, it was the losing the, the fraud was one of the, the grieving steps losing the money was another one losing the company was another one and then I have to, in order mm-hmm. to sell it, I sign a non-compete. So that, by the way, ends this month. And I, and I had to, so I lost my career. So that was mm-hmm. another time where my wife, the support with my wife was essential. And I remember she told me, take some time, take some time off. So you don't continue building the same out of momentum, out of the same, doing, keeping doing the same. But I was probably the first time in my life where I felt like, I, I lose my driving, my drive to create. Uh, it was deep. Mm-hmm. I take some time off and I create, I follow with the beautiful guidance of my daughter in a, in a New Year's Eve. She asked me, Papi, I, I, you always tell me to follow my dreams and I don't see you happy. What do you want to do? And I was so beautiful, the question. And with that, we create a, a, a space for healing, for helping people with my wife on one side. And on the other side, because th- th- this is, this is very like a passion, like a, a something that I do because I love, but I don't want to make this a, a source of income that I have to sustain the family and pay the bills. So, mm. so on the other side, I also keep doing my consultancy in the in the industry that I was working on for many years and as that's what I'm doing up to today and we'll see if the dunk okay. ends how I move <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I want to let's go back and unpack some of that so first of all I just want to make clear that you didn't commit fraud you were a victim of fraud <laughs> yes <I was laughs> it's a, a very very important distinction yes <laughs> 
<laughs> the way you told that story it was a little bit like yes. oh this guy deserved that no no you were a victim of fraud and when I, I was reading something you wrote and you said the term business grief and when you said that i was like oh Wow, because I, I often do feel that people just are very linear about grief and they think that grief is just like when you have the loss of a person, right? Of a, but the the truth is grief is when you lose anything that's really deep and meaningful to you, right? And this here had been this business, it had been your baby. I mean, anybody who's been an entrepreneur knows the kind of work that it takes to grow a company to the level that you had grown it and and then all of a sudden it's gone right the the wealth is gone the business is gone and I, there's also um for me I often talk about it as so before I became a coach I used to be an art director I used to be a graphic designer and I know, for me to become a graphic designer, like there was a lot of work and uh, there was a certain pedigree. Like I went to one of the top art schools and I graduated top of my class and I worked at Sony Music and I had all of this sort of prestigious job on my resume. And I remember the the transition of like letting go of the ego part of like I'm a designer and this is my this is who I am. Like what am I if I'm not a designer? So I imagine that part of what you were grieving was like the your identity in some way, right? Like who you had known to yourself to be in that in that way. I mean, just grief all around. Yes. How I guess let's talk about how did you how did you heal from that? How did you go to work at at repairing yourself from that because I'm just thinking it out and it had to be pretty deep. I, I think, well, we all have tools to help us, you know, uh, work in in those nights, uh, those dark moments. I, I, I'm being helpful and grateful for having those from people and also from uh, plant medicines and so, but my, my family, my wife, a lot of listening was super important for me. A lot of, because at the end, it's either that life is harsh, is bad, or life is telling me something. So I'm, the question is, if I'm allowing myself to listen, what life is telling me? Do I need to continue being in that archetype, in that character? Is that the best version of me? Or maybe there is a a better version. But only by losing and be able to get rid of what we have, I had had of that image, especially as a lender, because as a lender, there is a lot of ego and you are the money guy, you are the the big guy. You You, you go to the best hotels and you travel, you have the best cards. And losing that, and, and also the image that I have in the industry, you know, and, and open myself to the unknown and deeply listening was very important in my process. Did your spiritual journey begin before this happened or did it begin as a result of this uh, situation? Uh, and no, you... no, I think my spiritual path began since I was a child. I remember my my, okay. my sister was telling me when I was like three or four years old, and I was playing drums with some pots and and, and singing "Hey, hey so Cristo," a, a, a sound from 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 from, from about Jesus. But uh, no, I, I mean, I remember in two thousand, I got a I got into a crisis where I was deeply questioned if the best version of me is through being a lender because. The archetype of a lender and an attorney are in the in the lower scale of a spirituality. <laughs> you have the coaches, you have the spiritual guy, that, and ah, you have the uh, <laughs> attorneys and, and lenders. 
And I was that, that that's why I think your story is so <laughs> fascinating and I wanted to talk to you because I'm like, how do you go from there to like here? Like <laughs> it, it's fun. It's fun. I, I, I remember at that time I went to visit a lady that she was it's a, like a guru, like a medium, that's medium, medium worship. And uh, she was saying, telling me, Gabriel, you are wrong. Everything in the in the in the universe is energy and everything is neutral. Is however you move it. And one of the most effective ways of helping people is by, uh, through money. Very effective. So, mm-hmm. and it was so empowered to me that I ended up purchasing the bulk, the control of the chairs of my company the, back then in 2015. Mm-hmm. But uh, to answer your question, it, it, it has been very relevant in my path, the, in my business path, my spiritual work. Super relevant because at the end, I remember I, one day I heard something. It says that you can only escape from a prison if you first acknowledge that you are in a prison. Once you get to acknowledge that you are in a prison, you can escape from it. And, and part of the main prisons that we have is it has to do with money and it has to do with with being a provider, especially for men, men, and of course a single mom, I'm talking, I mean, it's super important, but especially for men, like we have to be the providers and we have no ability to fail. We're not, and we cannot access emotions <laughs> and cry <laughs> because that, that is super, super sad because doesn't, doesn't allow us to be the best expressions of who we are and and being able to break or to or to question those ideologies imposed by society requires somehow to get into the spiritual part i i, I think is mm. in in really going myself and who i am what i'm here for what is my purpose in life and those are not questions about if i'm gonna be in in one profession or the other, but uh, how I going to to walk on a daily basis, my life, and and if my work is in alignment with my higher purpose, mm-hmm. and that's the spirituality. So you were already you were already asking yourself those questions when this happened, right? Like you were already in an inquiry of. Am I living the best version of myself? Am I in alignment with what really matters to me? So that by the time this happened, you were able to really receive it as a, because it was very powerful for, your response was very powerful to, to, to have all this tragedy happen to you and then your response be, what's this here to teach me? What am I, what, what, what's the lesson in this for me? It's, I mean, you're, you're talking about it kind of casually, but but it's really a very <laughs> powerful response, and I think most most human beings would struggle with with getting there. So that's why I wanted to dig deeper and see if like if this really was for you, if this was birth out of that struggle, or if it was. But it sounds like you already had up some some foundation in place that allowed you to be in this conversation in this way. Yes, I I was blessed to have some tools, very important tools in my life, and I, I need to add to that, <laughs> to to the soup <laughs> that was boiling. My wife was diagnosed with cancer while this was happening, so so <laughs> so it really really put my head down to the ground, and I and I knew there was a time for a hard stop. I need to stop. My wife was telling me to stop and I say, okay. And, and, and I really stopped uh, a, a lot of what I, that was in my, at the moment that I received the information that I received was to, to observe my thoughts, just to observe the thoughts. Because, because we may have a tendency to become apocalyptic. So we start, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm a failure. I'm, 
and whatever I want to do in my life. So how am I going to be able to pay the bills? So he, a lot of was to observe the thoughts, to, to, to put my mind, to, to see the thoughts where came from, came from, the were created from a, a space of fear or love. And if there came from a space of fear, if, if the thoughts were valid, because most of those apocalyptic thoughts were just options, that the bulk will never come to reality. So mm-hmm. are those useful for me? Does provide me a good information or it helps me or not? If not, so how could I get into thoughts based on love and allowing myself to be present there in a space of unknown. I remember it was so deep that I went to a, a, a lady, very famous lady that does astrology. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, Gabriel, you right now, you are like if a building collapses and it's full of dust, you, you, you are in that space where you are not supposed to see where to aim. You need to be there. And with the first glimpse of wind, you will take your sails and you will ship. You take your ship in the direction that, that you need to take it. But be there. <laughs> it was beautiful. Be, I mean, it was be hot. in the <laughs> in it be in the no direction. Be in the sort of like just fit in the mess for a while. Is is that what we're talking about? Like, because I mean, it, it's interesting because even for me, when I look, I can say I can. I'm a leadership coach, so my instinct is to come at it from, okay, what are we gonna do? And 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 the idea of just sitting there in the stillness of the mess, and not like immediately pick up a br- a broom and start cleaning up. It's it's interesting. It's confronting in some ways. It's like, huh? But but I can see the how unwilling we are to just be in the stillness of the mess and be in the quiet of that and 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 hear what they're trying to teach us and the lessons that are coming in that. It's part of the peeling of the onion. I realized I was in a prison. I was in a prison, working in a certain way that I was not allowing me to flow in, in the best expression of myself. It allowed me to open the space for a new version of me without knowing what expression shall be. A lot of listening, a lot of listening, listening to myself, listening to my thoughts, observing again if the thoughts were came, came in from fear or from love, observing my intuition. What is the little, little step that I want to take first? Instead of trying to put my resume again, just, just to mm-hmm. see, see what, how I can benefit from this. How can, how can I use this in my advantage to create a better version of me? It was, it was hard, Gary. It was not an easy thing to do. It was, I remember I did the Camino de Santiago to do that. And I said, I need to walk. I need to be in silence. So I, chose to, to do the Camino Santiago by myself. And I took the route that is, has less people so I can, I was able to, to, to listen. Remember when I got to Santiago and I got to the cathedral, I got also, my, my daughter was in a big crisis. She was calling me, she was very depressed. So I got th- those three things in my, in my, in my mind, my wife with the cancer, my career and my daughter. And I start crying and crying when I got in, in front of the plaza of the cathedral. Very deep, very honoring myself, honoring, remembering one of my birthdays. I was by myself and I took my kayak by myself. And I was in the middle of the ocean and uh, not in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and, uh, and I told my son and the spirit out loud and said, Son, I'm sorry if I cannot pay your tuition in your college. I'm not going to do it. But I need to get out. Uh, allow me to get rid of all those obligations that have been imposed upon me by society. 
So I opened for the new. Okay. I totally opened myself to see what life would bring me and allowing myself to lose everything, including my wife. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was present for me. It's just, I don't know that you would recognize it at, at, as this at the time, especially, but what's present for me is just the courage of like sitting with your stuff. And I feel like we try to numb ourselves to that. We try to push it. We try to distract ourselves with our phones, internet, entertainment, sex, porn, drugs, whatever, right? We try to suppress that. But the the courage of just sitting with your stuff and allowing yourself to be still and and listen and be with it and allow yourself to experience the grief and the pain. It, it takes a great deal of courage to do that. And, but I think there's so much to learn from being willing to do that. I, I think a lot of us are spending a lot of time trying to run away from our shadows, right? Trying to run away from the, the stuff that, that, that haunts us at night that scares us. Yeah. So I just think it's very courageous that, that you were willing to do that. I want to, I want to talk about two more things. Well, I want to make sure we get into two things. Number one is I, I want to just give the listeners a, what happened next so that people know that because we're leaving them in the down part of the story. And I also want to get into a little bit of your journey in, in becoming an ancestral, a facilitator of ancestral ceremonies and, and that's how I met you through through these in- indigenous ceremonies, and it was, and it's a really beautiful practice. And I want, so I definitely want to make sure that we get into some of that as well. So you're in the cathedral, you're crying, your life fell apart. <laughs> 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 what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> what happened next? I-, I came back. I remember to Miami, and at that time I was. First, for synchronicity, I would say, Gary, we have already sold our property in Miami and we bought Mm -hmm. a farm in Homestead close to Miami. And at that time that you mentioned it, the intention was to bring titans or bring people that was come, that could come to our land to offer ceremonies, land land based ceremonies. but I get back to my, my, my property and I remember is when I mentioned you that for the first time I, I, I couldn't be able to, to create anything. It was, I would say that I was depressed, let's put it that way. And I start sitting a lot. I mean, and with my wife, of course, because my wife was with the cancer. And I sit with the plant medicines and listen. And it, was a, it has been, through many years for me, a very important tool that has helped me uh, overcome difficulties. It has been a very effective tool. So one of the things that when my daughter asked me about, what do you dream about? What came, I was riding a bicycle day, two, two days after that, and I, and I was, and I catch myself daydreaming, daydreaming of me offering ceremonies. And, and since I was, already a lot observing my thoughts and observing if they came from an space, an ap- apocalyptic space of fear, or if they come from love, I catch it and I say, well, hmm, interesting. Is this a thought based on love or fear? And I said, love, because I mean, how could I offer a whole space for ceremonies with plant medicines based on fear? I, cannot, I mean, it's based on love. So, okay. okay. So, so I remember I came back to my wife and I, and I, I we sent more the intention instead of having the land to offer or other people to come and offer ceremonies here for us to start offering those ceremonies ourselves. Uh-huh. And that was a, a beautiful and very important decision, not only for me, but for, for my wife, for her healing in her cancer. Because she also got from the plants Let's say you will heal, but you will heal through service. Um, so we say, okay, let's establish the church. 
and we established the church. And also in the meantime, since I, I, I started doing my consultancy and in the financial industry, something that I know, I mean, the industry that I know, so I can continue paying the bills in the, in the meantime. And that's where I am, Gary. That's what I'm doing. And I'm, I enjoy my, my financial services. I think it's service at the end. The way that I see it is a service in people. And, and I, I may, con- uh, for now, I'm going to continue doing that and make it back to the industry since my not compete ends this month. Some, some way or the other, but not, not full time because for sure my passion is through Tierra Mor for, for our, our, our services offering ceremonies. And the reason why we do is I, from my own experience, it has been very effective on me. Mm-hmm. It has been, it's, it's probably the tool that, that has been more effective. Besides, of course, the support from my wife has been this is very important for me too. Uh, so I think a lot of our listeners are going to be new to the concept of plant medicine and these ancestral ceremonies. And I, I would love to spend some time to just explain, break down a little bit this information so that people understand that these tra- cuz the interesting thing is like they're sort of getting a little trendy right now and in, in a way but these ceremonies these practices these medicines are ancient i mean ancient ancient and they have a beautiful tradition and and it's beautiful that they're getting some attention as well but i think it's also important to understand where they came from and and the the connection that that those of us especially who have indigenous i mean i think everybody has some everybody has some indigenous background on some level but those of us that feel connected to that indigenous background it's very meaningful for us especially to participate in these ceremonies and participate in these practices i, I will say gary that Mm. It's a it's a blessing that um, you use the word trendy. I I, I will use the the word th- that is that are getting back to be known. Let's put it away. After the the sixties, where some tools were used incorrectly because were used mm-hmm. in a recreational way or in a way to escape. In reality, what well, I mean, I was, I mean, in my experience, let's put it that way, I can only talk for myself. In my experience, these tools are very effective in knowing ourselves. So it's like if I go to a therapist and I can tell to a therapist my situation, first, I, I can only tell what I have in my consciousness, I cannot tell what I have in my subconscious. Mm-hmm or what I have suppressed. Then the therapist receives information through the lenses of their experience and using their what they have learned in, in, in college, they give us a feedback that again, we receive through our own lenses. So it's a lot of information that is lost in between. Mm-hmm. When we enter in these sacred spaces with these medicines, we go in communion with ourselves. We see ourselves in the mirrors and, uh, and we tap to access the subconsciousness. We tap to, we get to access the, the mystical part and uh, so are very effective. Um, and there is, of course, a lot of things that are unknown, a lot of fear, which is okay because part of what we do is entering into a space that we are vulnerable, that we open the space of the unknown and listen and feel, get in contact with our emotions. So, 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 so I think that's, that's, that's important for me to express. Also that when someone received the call, because it, this is something that 
they sh shall not be done because someone did it and so let's let's see what what is this going on like uh, you go to a restaurant because you become famous no is is a is a call and shall be a call when we are open we open ourselves to see with ourselves to become a better human to peel from us situations that we don't need to carry with us anymore to be able to to forgive and eventually to love life unconditionally and love us unconditionally knowing who we are in capital letters that at the end is getting read read of a lot of ideologies dogmas uh, that we have set into ourselves that doesn't serve us good anymore and I, I think for me that's what these ceremonies are for i love it yeah and i think um i think my use of the word trendy comes from a concern that i have about the things that I love about you and your wife and what you're doing in Tierra Amor is that, first of all, the very clear, your training is very clear. Your experience is very clear. The, the reverence that you have for the processes that you carry out and for the experience of the participants that come through your church it's very palpable and i i ha i have a concern that's not that's not always the case and so i think that's why i use that word right like i think that you there's just a lineage that you and your wife come from and have are carrying out that's very obvious in in that you're you're carrying out these ancient traditions and it's a really beautiful practice and i was really moved by your just the the reverence that you have for the work the reverence that you have for the medicines the reverence that you have for the people and the love and i want to i want to make i wanted to make sure to distinguish that from other experiences that i had that felt trendy <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think the, um, the intention is super important, Gary. If the person that is going to see it with the ceremonies have a, an intention at, of healing or an intention to, to know yourself, then you are going to resonate with someone that is going to provide you that. So you will avoid getting to a uh, convenience with this or taking these medicines just for recreation. Because it, it is it's not the correct use of those tools yeah. for recreation. Yeah. But if the person has the correct intention, I'm sure that correct uh, opportunity and place will come for them. Yeah. But what, what we create, it, what we manifest is very important. Yeah. And that's not the only thing you guys do. You guys have sweat lodges. You do uh, a lot of community events as well. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about you guys is that you're musicians and you you do bonfires where everybody's just sharing indigenous songs. It's a really beautiful. It's a really beautiful space where you guys have created. And if anyone is ever in Homestead or you want to come travel down for to experience it, it's absolutely worth the trip. I highly recommend it. And my partner is, is, is coming to you soon, by the way. Beautiful. He just, yes. he just yes. got the call. Yes. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. He beautiful, just got beautiful. the call, so you'll be seeing him soon. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, Gabriel, you are lovely. It's so fun to talk to you. And I'm really, on a personal level, just very grateful to have found you in your space and special shout out to our friend Jennifer for connecting us and introducing me to you guys and I hope to be part of your community for many years to come. Aho, aho, Karen. And, and in terms of the intention of the meeting, which is also for, for the business people, probably my 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 prayer is to connect, to do the, to work in something that really resonates 
with the person that mm. that whatever we do is is in alignment with our higher best expression of ourselves and it's what I have be, been in my case so so because because ceremonies are great for giving us the tools so in the daily life our daily ceremony of life is is beautiful and and yes there, there's grieving and it's important and it's necessary and it's a beautiful opportunity that we can take that we shall take and and there are tools for sure to help us through coaching through plant medicine to whatever it is for us to be able to to listen if we are creating from a space of love a space of fear and what do we deserve what do we want to create because we deserve to be happy we deserve to be whole complete and do the things that we truly love to do and the money follow that path no vice versa instead of dancing for the money is dancing for life for ourselves with joy and come and money comes as a result of doing that no vice versa amen <laughs> thank you for being in the show gabriel you're welcome always always I, whatever can do for 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 your community i would love to to be at service i think it was precisely gabriel's willingness to sit in his grief and reflect that allowed him to discover what was next it was that willingness to sit still in the quiet that allowed him to hear what was next and begin the courageous path of pivoting his life, of letting go of his material attachments and his old identity. He didn't run away from it, he leaned into it and asked himself, what is this here to teach me? Is this the best version of me? I think asking those questions requires a great deal of courage. To be in the void of a question unanswered, to be willing to let go of how you've seen it your entire life, requires courage. And more importantly, to be willing to receive the answer, wherever it may take you, requires courage. In today's instant gratification world, we're constantly looking for that next dopamine hit. This means we're not always the best at being uncomfortable, at struggling, at having the patience to sit still in the quiet and listen to our intuition. But what if instead of reacting, we paused? What if instead of rushing to figure out the answer, we allow ourselves to sit in the quiet, to lean into the void and allowing yourself to just be? There's a divine intelligence in your body and your intuition. I said this before on the show, we're always being spoken to at all times. The question is, are you courageous enough to sit in the silence? As always, thank you for joining me this week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with two or three people in your life that you think will enjoy the message. If we work together, we can spread the message of personal ownership to as many people as possible. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Ownership Game with your host, Gary Montalvo. Make sure to like and comment on your favorite podcast platform, as well as subscribe so that you never miss an episode.